Good morning. Welcome to Highlands Church of God. Y'all are a great looking bunch today. Thank you, thank you. Is anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Did I say it out loud? <laughs> the best place we can be besides heaven, right? Y'all stand this morning, worship with us. We're going to exalt our King. Jesus is still King. I love to tell people that. Amen. You look around, everything going on in the world, and, and people get upset and in turmoil. But Jesus is still King. And God's not fretting. And he's not worried. Brother, I got the CD in the speaker. We're going to get it right. Yes, thank you, thank you. So I'm excited to be here in the house of the Lord today. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's peace in the house of the Lord. There's freedom in the house of the Lord. So whatever your need is this morning, praise with us. We're going to praise. We're going to go into worship. We're going to exalt our king. Whatever needs you brought in, leave it at his feet. Don't go out with it. Leave it at his feet. Let's worship. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy in the of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes the way. He hung up on that cross. Jesus, 
We thank you, God, for salvation. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There we go. Praise God. Oh, well, let's uh, read these couple of verses together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing to the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. I really like that part. Give Him glorious praise. Amen. I don't know what you're going through today. We're all going through something. But right now, let's give Him all the praise and honor He deserves. Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for this opportunity. Lord, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus for our Holy Spirit to stir us up today. Lord, let us give You the honor and glory and praise that's due Your name today. For great is our God and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Praise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Praise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, loud and loud, you're gonna hear my praises roar up on the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated.
How many of you know that your praise is a weapon? That your worship is a weapon? You know, before Satan took everything from Job, he had to ask. And God said, well, try my servant Job. But Job still praised. So there's going to be things in life that we got to walk through that we don't like, that we don't want to go through. But our praise is a weapon, and our worship is a weapon, and it baffles the enemy when he knows the trials that we're walking through, and yet we still worship. Okay, you're coming at me harder. I'm, my praise is going to get louder. Because the king is still alive, and he still died for me on the cross, and I've read the end of the book, and we win. I just got to stay the course, and I just got to worship. And I just got to praise, and I got to read my word, and I got to pray, and I got to witness, and I got to come together into his house with the body of believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to strengthen each other. So whatever your need is today, raise your hallelujah. Remember, there's no other name by which we can be saved except Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes when you can't say anything else, just say Jesus, because there's going to come a day that every knee, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Are you going to do it here, or are you going to do it later when it's too late? So whatever you're walking through today, I just encourage you, just speak Jesus to whatever your situation is. You got kids that aren't saved? You got grandkids that aren't saved, aren't living right? Are you sick in your body? Do you need something financially? Do you need a miracle? Because he still performs those. So just speak Jesus.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for our families, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. Just take a moment to worship him in your own words, in your own song. The King of kings and Lord of lords. The one who made the ultimate sacrifice for us when none of us were worthy.
Child of God, sing it again. You split the seas. You split the seas so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. There should be no more fear. Let your fears just drown away. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child. 
child of God. We are children, Lord. Yes, Father. We worship you in this place this morning. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Give him a praise this morning. Hallelujah. He's rescued us. He's rescued us. We deserve death and sin and separation and wrath, but he rescued us with a plan through his son Jesus. And that's our way back to the Father. And he calls us children of God. Amen. Is he not amazing? He is amazing. Just take a minute, just in your own way, in your own words, just for a few seconds, just praise Him and thank Him. Thank Him for rescuing you. Thank Him for praising, uh, for worshiping. Thank you, God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, God. Thank Him for rescuing us, rescuing us, saving us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's move into a time of corporate prayer as we intercede on behalf of all the needs out there in the body. I know there's many. We also have a praise. Uh, Mark and Amber are not here this morning. As you notice, I had to fill in on the drums, unfortunately. But um, so they are now grandparents. Let's praise that. Grandparents are first time grandparents. A healthy baby boy was born late last night. That's exciting. And so uh, that is something to praise. Also, I know there's needs in the body. And so if you have a need this morning, just raise your hand real big so we can see. And there's needs all over the room. And so let's intercede and believe that if we uh, enter into God's presence by faith, that he will hear us from heaven and he will answer our needs. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, God. You are a good God. You're an awesome God. You're a holy God. God, you are great and greatly to be praised. And so this morning, God, you saw hands raised all over this congregation of needs in the body. Lord, we come to you trusting and knowing that where two or more are gathered, we can call out to you our needs and you will hear us. And so, God, we lay these needs at your feet. We trust you with them. We know that we can't do it on our own, but you are a God who's sovereign over all. You can do this. And so we trust you right now. God, I pray that you'll bring peace, you'll bring supernatural presence and power into the lives of all of those with the needs that they had a hand raised right now, that they will feel your presence in their life, they'll feel you moving in and through them, they will hear your voice and know that they're not alone, that you are with them, walking with them through whatever it is. God, that should give us hope, that should give us joy, that should give us an excitement on our lips to turn and praise you and worship you and thank you for who you are. God, we're thankful for new life as we celebrate the life of this grandchild that was brought into the world late last night. And we pray your hand of protection on this life. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will intervene and draw uh, this new life to you, God, through Jesus Christ, to live eternally with you. God, that's our prayer for all the lost. Lord, that you will help them to find a way to see uh, your gospel presented, God. That your Holy Spirit will prick their hearts and they will believe and confess that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. So they can also be found in eternity in heaven with you. And God, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for what you're going to do and what you've already done here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys may be seated for a few moments. Welcome this morning to Highlands Church of God. I'm so excited that all of you are here. And if this is your first time in one of our services, or maybe your first time in a long time, we consider you a guest and we want to welcome you. Church, let's greet and welcome our guests this morning. There's a welcome center out here by the front door, and you're going to find a little welcome card here. Please fill this out and showing us that you're a guest and tell us a little bit about yourself. And they're going to give you a nice gift that they have there at the welcome center for you. And we are so glad that you're here. If you keep coming back, we're going to call you family, right, church? Because we believe we are a family. Um, at this time, the children that are here want to be dismissed for Children's Church. You can be dismissed at this time. So go ahead over there. That's right. We're excited that the children have a place to go and, and worship Jesus. That's awesome. I want to tell you guys about an app that we have. It's called Remind. And if you will text to that number right there, 81010 and text at HCG2045, which is Highlands Church of God and our address here, at HCG2045, 
and you type it to that number, 81010, you'll be in a list of texting lists where we can get a hold of you, give you information, let you know about things that are happening at the church. We're not going to text you every day and every night. I promise you we're not going to overwhelm you with texts. But we do want to give you some important information sometimes, and it's a good way for us as a church to be able to reach you and let you know if there's something important happening or something we need to know. And so if you would, just take a picture of that real quick or something, and you can do that later, but just text that uh, message to that number right there, and you'll be on our remind list, okay? All right, hey, Wednesday nights, last Wednesday, who was here last Wednesday night for our new Bible study? Was it awesome? We had a great time together uh, just uh, talking about uh, 1 John and opening up the passage. We got through the introduction and only the first three verses. So if you didn't make it, you didn't miss anything too important, we're going to do a recap this Wednesday night. So you'll, you'll jump right in with us. Please come out Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. It's a great time to be together. We also have classes for all the families. So if you have children or youth, we have classes for them as well. We have an awesome youth ministry that's growing. They had posted some things on Facebook. If you're on Facebook and you saw, they did some awesome fun things last week. So we're excited to see that ministry grow as well. And uh, so just come out on Wednesday nights because there's a lot of fun things happening. And uh, the Bible study is rich and deep. And it's great that we all get involved and we all get to uh, participate together. I love that. All right. That's all the announcements I have for you guys this morning. Casey's going to come up and he's going to do the offering for you guys this morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord still? Amen. Amen. You know, um, in the Old Testament, all the, all the New Testament commands are, are rooted um, in you finding joy in the act of doing what you're doing for God. You know, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it tells us, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He wants us to, to cheerfully and joyfully give everything that we do. All acts of love involving giving involve giving something of yourself. It doesn't matter what it is, either whether you're giving it here or you're giving out there. It, it involves love. Um, just doing it or just give it is never the command. Um, whatever you give needs to be done in love. You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, it tells us no matter what you say, what you believe, or what you do, without love, you are bankrupt. You, you, you gain absolutely nothing if you don't give in love. You can you could end world hunger, and if you don't do it with love, it, it was all, you just you wasted your time, essentially. And... Um, that's why it says decide in your heart what you want to give. And that's not just saying decide how much you're going to give. That's not, that's not the whole purpose of that. It's, to, it's to, um, to get you involved with what you're doing. It protects you from being reluctant when, you, when it comes time to give. And, it, and it's not something you're going to be giving under compulsion. It frees you from worry when it's time to give so that you can give cheerfully and joyfully. So, so if you've already decided about what you're going to do with your money or what, you, what you're going to give and how you're going to give it, you're not going to second-guess yourself when the offering plate comes by or when that person walking down the street, you see somebody in need, you're not going to say, do I have enough money for that? No, decide ahead of time that you're going to help somebody, that you're going to involve yourself in someone's life, whether, and it doesn't have to be money. Decide ahead of time that you're going to help somebody and go out and purposefully and intentfully do it. You know, you can, um, so today I want you to, to make up in your mind why you're giving today. Uh, are you giving today because you have a thankful heart and you want to bless God or because God has blessed you? You want to give respectfully because God is God and he deserves it? Uh, you give today because of a joyful heart because God is so good to you or do you just give because you love God? Because he's a good God and he deserves everything because of what he's given to us. Find your purpose today in giving and give it joyfully. Ushers, you guys can go ahead and come forward. Um, a few ways you guys can give here today. You can download our Ministry One app from the Google Store, the App Store. Um, you can text the word GIVE to 863-400-1596, or you can go to our website, highlandcog.org. Also, we got the kiosk working in the back, so y'all can use that, um, or you can just drop in the off plate, however you want to do it. Lord, we praise you, and we give you all the glory, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for, for giving us cheerfully and joyfully, allowing us to give to you in that way, Lord. We praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
sing that last part again. Oh, Jesus. stay in his presence for just a second oh Jesus isn't it awesome to be in his presence his presence is heaven to us let's sing that part again oh Jesus Presence is heaven. Your presence is heaven to me. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Thank you for your presence, Jesus. Thank you for being with us and in us. Thank you for allowing your church to be united in your presence. Let's sing it again with no instruments, no one on the stage. I want to hear you guys singing. Go ahead. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. His presence. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. If you can see it in his presence right now. Awesome. Wow, he is good, isn't he, church? His presence is heaven. His presence is heaven. Hallelujah. Hmm. Thank you, worship team. Didn't they do a great job this morning? Thank you, worship team. Amber was set to lead the team today, and Delane stepped in, and they did awesome. I'm very proud of all of them, what they've done. Stepped in a last-minute notice, so we're thankful that we have an awesome, talented group. <laughs> we won't go there. All right. Have you ever had someone who acted ungrateful about a gift you gave them? You ever had someone that was ungrateful? Maybe you gave them something they were ungrateful to you? I know I've been ungrateful before in my life. I'm not proud of it now, but when I was a teenager... I was ungrateful for many things. Looking back, I can see I was ungrateful for things. I was even given a car by my grandfather, but because it wasn't a cool sports car or a truck, I was a little ungrateful. I didn't act ungrateful, but inside, you know, I wished it was something better, something cooler, nicer. Until I was driving to work one day, and I was turning in on Highway 27, which is, can be a dangerous road, and a Jeep hit me at over 60 miles an hour in the back, and it was a big car, all right? It was a 79 Ford Thunderbird, so if you can picture, about as long as this room. And, uh, and so even though the Jeep hit me and spun me into a ditch and I was on my side and everything, but I was safe, I was fine in that big car. And then I had to start bumming rides for a while, right? Because now I didn't have a car. And then I really uh, realized how much I should have been grateful for the car. Sometimes we can be ungrateful by not remembering something very important in our lives. Maybe someone has done something for us and we've forgotten to honor them or we've forgotten to thank them for what they have done. That can make us ungrateful or seem ungrateful. And church, I want you to know that God has given us something to be eternally grateful for. It's the most important gift we've ever been given. This gift has eternal implications and it has led to more gifts 
that we do not deserve and we have not earned. These gifts are not because of us. They are not to shine any light on us. They're not to lift us up. They're not to build us into something bigger than we are. These gifts and the giver are purposed for the glory of someone else. The one who is worthy of it all. The one who loves all. Jesus. We're giving gifts for Jesus' glory. Now, we've been going through a series together asking the question, what's next? Because as a church and as a family, we're transitioning into a new season of anointing and mission. We have a purpose and a calling to fulfill. We have done this by looking through a section of Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, which applies to us today. So the first week, we unpacked step one. We were in Ephesians 3, starting with verse 14. We talked about the fullness of God, remember? We talked about God, that He gives us His power, He gives us His presence, and He gives us His peace. The next week, we moved into chapter 4 of Ephesians. In step two, we talked about walking in unity, where we saw God telling us to be encouraged, to have the character of the worthy walk, and to be eager about being in unity. Isn't it great to be in unity together, to be united corporately? Last week, we took a break. We took a little breath because we were talking about confidence in the storm as Hurricane Ian came through and was a great reminder to us about our confidences in Christ through the storms of life. But today, we're going back to our series, What's Next? And we're at step three now, and we're going to talk about remembering the gift. God has given gifts to us. Have we received them? Are we grateful for them? Are we using them for the right reasons? So let's continue in Ephesians, and we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 today. And that's where I'm going to start reading as Paul writes to the Ephesian church in verse 7. He says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this place, God. Thank you for your word. God, we pray your Holy Spirit will illuminate and highlight these words of Scripture into our hearts and into our minds, that it will cause us God, to want to do something for you. God, it'll cause us to be stirred to action. It'll cause us to grow as a church in our unity and our strength and our purpose. God, let your words penetrate us. Give us your mission, your goal. In Christ's name we pray all this. Amen. Amen. So as we just read those four passages in Ephesians 4, starting with verse 7, I want you to remember three things this morning. First, I want you to remember your past. Verse 7 said, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. There's two aspects of grace we're going to talk about in this verse. The first is saving grace. Saving grace. What was our condition prior to knowing Jesus? Where were we? Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know that when... We sinned the first time we sinned in our life that we were eternally separated from God. That we deserved wrath and punishment because God is perfect, He's holy, His standard is high and there's no way we can come back to that perfection when we sin against Him because we're rebelling. We're called enemies of God. We're rebellious to Him. We're sinners. That's the condition we all start in. But God had a plan from the beginning of time to bring us back to Him. And this plan is amazing. It's, it's a free plan that He offers to us. We, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. You can't work for it. You can't pay to it. You can't do enough to get in the club or to get the check mark by your name. There's nothing we can do to get this gift. But He freely offers it to us. And it's based on our belief that Jesus is Lord our confession that God raised Him from the dead, our faith, 
that He is Christ and Lord for us and that He died for us and that He resurrected for us. And when we believe that and we confess that, the Bible says we are saved. That's how we get put back into relationship with God. The whole story of the Bible is to show us how our relationship was severed, but God made a plan. He's running to us to bring that relationship back whole so that we can be in relationship with Him. He's doing it for us because we can't do it. Each of us in here have sinned against God and deserve His wrath. We're just something He created. But He chose to love His creation so much that John 3.16 tells us what? For God so loved the world, He sent His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus is God, Emmanuel, God with us. He comes to earth in flesh form through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the Virgin Mary. He comes to earth, and then He never sinned. Jesus never sinned as He walked on earth. He came to live that perfect life as one of us that we couldn't do, that we couldn't live. He lived it for us, free from sin, in order that He could be the spotless Lamb that could be sacrificed for our sins. Sacrificing His life for His people. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we were perfect or right or good to die for us. While we were sinners still, while we were His enemies, while we were rebelling against Him, while we were deserving wrath and punishment and destruction, He came to earth and died for us because of His love for us. And the Holy Spirit is the agent of that grace. He draws us to Jesus in that finished work that He performed on the cross. Amen. Our belief and our confession activates our faith. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, those of us in here this morning that have experienced that in our past, do you remember? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the change in your heart and in your life when you became a child of God? Do you remember how it felt, the change you felt on the inside? Maybe nothing exteriorly changed. Maybe it did. Maybe you went from a frown to a smile. Maybe you had a laugh. Maybe you couldn't stop smiling. But do you remember the moment? I want you guys to remember his free gift of grace to you. Remember your past. The other aspect of grace this verse is referencing is equipping grace. <clears throat> Jesus told the disciples in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus has gone to sit at the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, has come to give us gifts for Jesus. And these are some of the gifts He gives us. He gives us the fruit of the Spirit. He gives us the, the gifts that we feel, the gifts of the Spirit that we can see and that are tangible to us. He gives us the offices of the church, among many others. He goes and He gives us gifts. He's brought gifts to this earth. These gifts are given for equipping the saints, for building up the church, for boldly going and making disciples of all nations. Amen. Jesus, through the working of His Spirit, apportions the gifts and the amounts to each of us as He wills it, for what He wills it for, and for how long He wills it to be. The gifts are from Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to us. Why? Why? So that Jesus can be glorified. So that Jesus can be proclaimed. So that Jesus can be in relationship with others. And the church will be ready to be received by the bridegroom when Jesus returns. That's why we have gifts. He is equipping us. Remember your past. Amen. He saved you by His grace. He's equipped you with His gifts. Through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Remember your past. The second thing I want you guys to think about in this passage in Ephesians it's to remember your present. Remember where we are now. Ephesians 4, 8, 9 says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. 
In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. After his death on the cross, Jesus went to paradise to free those saints who were held captive until his blood paid for their sins. Then after he resurrected and right before his ascension, he issued his final command to the disciples. Matthew records it beautifully in chapter 28, and we call it the Great Commission. And we're going we're gonna to camp here at the Great Commission for a little bit this morning. Because I want us to sense what Jesus was doing and saying to the disciples and what he's saying and doing through us, the descendants and the disciples of today. So I'm going to read Matthew 28, 16 through 20 this morning to you guys. The word says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Did you see where that started in 1617? It talks about the 11 disciples. They went to Galilee. Well, Who are these 11 people? Who are they? Well, we know Judas Iscariot, he's already betrayed Jesus and got his 30 pieces of silver, and then he's already died. So Judas is not one of them anymore. But we have Peter and Andrew, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus and Simon. Why did they show up? Because when Jesus was dying on the cross, what did they do? They scattered. Their, their leader was dead. He was gone. They, they didn't know what to do, so they were fearful and they scattered. Who were these 11 people? Why was this their reaction? But then Jesus came back and, and appeared to them, didn't he? And showed them his body post-resurrection. Thomas even came and touched the hands and feet. Saw the scars in his body, his resurrected body. He had a body. And so Jesus told them. And so they went to Galilee, back to their home base of operations where they all started. And they go to a mountain and Jesus is coming. And he's going to speak to them one last time on this earth before he ascends. Would you have gone? If you were in that position, you were scared for your life, the Roman Empire was powerful, would you have gone? Why did they show up? Verse 17 even said to us that some doubted. Even when they saw him on the mountain and they came and he said he was going to be there, they see him, they start worshiping him. But then verse 17 says, but some still doubted. Who are these guys? The reason I'm pointing this out to you is because I want you to know the scriptures. I want you to understand the true meaning of the word. Get the cultural context of what's happening. Thousands of years have passed, and sometimes we forget that it's a different culture, a different time, a different society, and so we got to get that context back so we understand who they are and what they're doing. we got to know the inside stories of what was happening. But we also must make time to get quiet with God so that the Holy Spirit can come and help us to learn and understand His Word. Amen. Don't we want to learn from God? Yes. Because He's not posting His answers on Facebook. He's not tweeting it on Twitter. He's not hashtagging to Instagram. He's speaking to us through His Word and in our prayer life. I want you guys to get into His Word. And I want to tell you a little story about a book I read a few years ago called Firing Jesus. I don't know if any of you ever read it. I was a youth pastor at the time. And it was a story about this church. This was a small congregation. They were dying. They were dying off as they aged, and there was no life, there was no young people coming, no families, no children. And so the congregation goes to the pastor, and they're complaining, and they're saying, Pastor, we need life, we need young people, we need, we need life in this church. And so he hires this young, exciting youth pastor. This youth pastor comes on board, and he's excited, he's fired up, he's going out to the streets, he's bringing kids in from all over the community, all these kids are coming. He's preaching the gospel to them. Lives are being transformed. And then they're going out and reaching other kids. And more kids are coming in. Now kids are all over the place. And some of the kids might be, look a little different than the church used to look. And they might be a little shady to people. Or they might be a little scary to people. Or they might act differently. Maybe they worship differently. Maybe they look a little different. And you know what that church did? They went to the pastor and said, Oh, pastor, we got too many kids around here. 
There's too much going on. We, we don't know uh, what's going on with these kids. They look different than us. They worship different than us. They talk different than us. We can't have this in our church. And so the pastor fires the youth pastor. And the church dies off a few years later. And the author, he makes this statement that Jesus was probably more like that youth pastor than that church knew. And he started showing some stuff in Scripture, with, which I thought was awesome. I, I'm a history guy. I love context. I love getting the inside story. So I'm going to tell you what he was pointing out and let you guys think about this. I'm not saying this is 100% accurate. I'm saying this is awesome to think about. Matthew 17, 24 through 27, it says, When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when Peter said, From others, Jesus said, Then the sons are free. However... Not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that shekel, give it to them for you and for me. So if you go all the way back to Exodus chapter 30 in the Old Testament, you see God institutes this tax, takes, tells uh, Israel to take a census for everyone age 20 and older as they come to worship in the tabernacle. So this is called the tabernacle tax, and later on it's called the temple tax. And everyone who came to worship at the temple or synagogue who was 20 years old or older had to pay the tax, which was half a shekel. If you exchange that into the Roman currency at the time, half a shekel equals two drachma. So you pay for two people, it's four drachma or one shekel. That's what Peter found in the fish, one shekel. And what this author was saying is that if you look through Scripture and look through the other stories of the New Testament and you look at the cultural context of the time, you might see that most of the disciples were probably teenagers. You know, growing up, I always picture these 30 and 40 year old gruff fishermen with long beards. And, but, you know, Jesus was only probably around 30. Peter was probably a little younger than him, but he was married. He was somewhere in his 20s, probably. And then the rest of the disciples might have been teenagers between 15 and 19. And Jesus goes back to his home base where he operates from in Galilee. And the leaders of the, the synagogue there in that town, they come up to Peter outside and they say, Hey, Peter, isn't your teacher going to pay the tax? Because the teacher owed the tax for him and his students. He had to pay for all of them. And Jesus is awesome because Peter walks in the door and before he says a word, Jesus is like, Hey, let me tell you a little story about who, who owes the tax, the sons or others. He just knew what it was. Before Peter even walked in and said a word, and Peter's like others, and he said, okay, then the sons are free, meaning they shouldn't have to pay the tax. He's a child of God. But to not give offense, we're going to do it. Go find, catch a fish. Peter's a fisherman. He goes and catches a fish. He finds a shekel in the mouth of the fish so he could pay the tax for two people, Jesus and himself. Why not the rest? Could it be because the rest of the disciples were under the age of 20? I don't know, but it's exciting to think about, isn't it? So let's look at the disciples in a new way this morning, for the first time maybe. Think of them as being younger, not old, but maybe young, maybe not with long beards, maybe zits on their face because they're teenagers. How about all those what were they thinking moments in the stories of the New Testament? How about when they were arguing over who was the greatest? Don't that sound like a bunch of teenagers arguing over who's better than the others? I'm better than you, my dad's better than your dad, that kind of thing. Remember that, teenagers? How about when they didn't want to let the small children get close to Jesus? Don't that sound like a bunch of bossy teenagers? Hey, I'm cool. I'm here. You can't come here. You're just a little kid. How about when they always wanted to fight and not use wisdom or restraint? Don't that sound like a bunch of young, scrapping teenage boys? They just want to fight. They don't want to use wisdom, restraint. How about when the disciples were scared at the bottom of the boat in the middle of a storm? Does that sound like a bunch of seasoned fishermen? Being huddled up scared in the bottom of the boat? No, they're going to be fighting the winds and waves and trying to save the boat. These guys were scared huddled in the bottom of the boat. How about even times in the scripture when Jesus called them children? Like when he sent them out on their own and called to call the people to repentance. So we see that circumstantial evidence around and we see the story of the tax being paid. And you can also look at the cultural context of the Jewish community in the time of Christ. And boys went to a formal training from the age of about 10 to about 15 away from their family. 
And they were sent to go memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. They would memorize the Psalms. They would memorize the history of the Jews. They would memorize the works of the prophets. And the ones who excelled, who did great at that, the leaders, the rabbis of the synagogue of the area, they would come by and they would start hand-selecting their choice students to be their student. And it was kind of like picking your team, you know, I want this one and I want this one. They would pick who they wanted to be their student, their disciple, their follower. Until the only ones left were like maybe the C students, the ones that barely got by in high school. Just glad I made it. They would be sent back home to learn the family trade. And in Galilee, fishing was big. And so we find many of the first disciples back there at home with their fathers learning the family trade when this brand new rabbi comes strolling along on the shores. And he walks up and he calls those guys to be his disciples. And they left all that they had and they followed him. Now, does this information really change anything? Maybe, maybe not. But it's exciting and interesting to picture teens learning from Christ, isn't it? And to think that Jesus was more like that youth pastor that was fired from that church than that church realized. It makes the stories come to life in a new way. It makes you want to go home and reread the New Testament in a new context and get a picture of what God's Word is saying. It helps us to see vulnerable people exposed to life in Christ and working toward more of Him and less of themselves, which should remind us of somebody. Oh yeah, us. Should remind us of us, of who we are. Here's the important thing. Get into His Word. Get excited about his word. It's not enough just to hear from me, your pastor, every week. Spend personal time with God, reading and researching and meditating on scriptures. So let's go back to the Great Commission. Where were we? We were in Matthew 28. The disciples are standing there at the base of the mountain. Jesus is there. He's going to speak to them for the last time on this earth. So let's hear what the Messiah says to them and what he's speaking to us through this word. Verse 18 says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus said, all authority. He starts with that claim. Why is that important? Why is that claim important? Well, that's actually taken from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel writes, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. His kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And Jesus is saying, that prophecy is fulfilled. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus says. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And the disciples, they would have known that prophecy. And when they heard that, it would have encouraged them. They would have known who Jesus was. That prophecy was written hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth. All authority, that means that God accepted his sacrifice and has given him all authority. Hallelujah. Should excite us this morning. That's the claim of Christ. He is the Messiah. All authority is given to him. And then after that claim, he gives his command. So he is the king with all authority. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. And he claims that and then he commands us. And his command is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That's the command given to us. Nations, that word nations, what that's referring to is families. Go to your families and make disciples. Then go to clans and make disciples. Then go to people groups and make disciples. Start with your families. Go to the bigger families, the clans, and then go to all the people groups because Jesus is Lord over all. He wants all to follow him, all to be his disciples, all to train and teach new disciples. That's what we're to do. As we make disciples, as disciples are made in what we're doing with Christ in the church, then we are to go and make new disciples. It's simple, guys. It's heaven and earth. And we are on earth, and we are supposed to show how to get to heaven. Jesus was heaven coming to earth for us. And we are to work for him as the church to bring people to heaven. What makes a disciple? Well, first... You have to be in Christ. You have to hear the gospel of Jesus. 
And we have to preach the gospel to make followers and then to teach them all that Jesus taught us. Who is to do this work? We are. You and me. We're to do this work. We're the disciples of Christ now. How do we do it? We have to submit to Him. We have to submit to His kingship, His lordship over us. That He's the one with all authority. And then we have to follow Him. The first disciples were called the followers of the way before they came to be called Christians. As Christians, we are to submit to our King and then follow Him. And we receive baptism in water as a sign of our commitment to follow Him. And then we teach. That's how Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire. All, Paul and John, all these guys were writing and teaching. They would go around and teach, the, preach the gospel of Jesus and teach them all that He commanded. That's how we multiply. We multiply through making other disciples by teaching and preaching the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus. Here's the best part, guys. We don't do it alone. We never have to do it alone. Christ sent His Spirit to empower us to work for Him. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us, active, operating to help us. He says, I will be with you always. He is with us. We're never meant to do it alone. Not only do we have God with us and in us, helping us and speaking to us, we also have the church, each other, strong and together, in unity, doing this together. We're called to be a community of faith. Believers going out and working together for the gospel. All of us. We gather here in our churches. We gather in church to learn from others. We get to hear others and their stories. We get to hear testimonies. We get to share testimonies with one another. We get to be encouraged to go to new places and share the gospel and make disciples in new places, locally and abroad. We preach the gospel to those we can convince to come into these doors. When people come in, what are we going to do? We're going to preach the gospel to them. If we meet them outside, what are we going to do? Preach the gospel. If they're inside, we preach the gospel. If they're outside, we preach the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We have to go to them and get them to come in. Compel them, the word says, to come in. We go where they are. We compel them to come in. We preach the word, preach the gospel. Whatever it takes to make an opportunity for them to hear the gospel at the same time, the Spirit pricks their heart and then they decide to believe and confess in Jesus as Lord and then there's salvation in the house. Is that exciting? Is that what we want? Is that what we want to see? Do we want to see disciples being made with the gospel doing its thing, the Holy Spirit coming and invading? That's what we want for the church. Verse 20, teach what? It says, to observe all that I have commanded you. There's a lot in the Gospels that Jesus taught in there. There's a lot of amazing things he taught us. But you need to know what you need to teach, right? It's your responsibility to know. No one else's. If you don't know what your king has said, you can't do what he's asked you to do, can you? We have to stay in his word. We have to know his word. But fear not. The last part, verse 20, it says, Behold, When you see that word, that means listen carefully. The next part is very important. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Man, that's good news. Is that not good news? He is with us. His spirit is inside of us. He loves us. He guides us. He is going with us every step of the way. That's good news this morning. Jesus is with you. We're going to land it now, guys. Remember your future. That's the third point. Back to Ephesians, our original passage. Remember your future. Remember our past. Remember our present. Remember your future. Ephesians 4.10 says, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus is on the throne. Do not fear. Jesus is on the throne. He rose victoriously. He went back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for us. He rules and reigns from his position there. He is on the throne. He ascended to the Father. He sent his Holy Spirit to help us to do the mission he's commanded us to do. 
He didn't leave us alone. He is with us through His Spirit. There's some actions we have to take as a church, individually. We have something we're called to do. We have the Spirit in us. What is the purpose? To make disciples, to glorify Christ, to preach the gospel, to go out into the world. It's not enough just to come in here and learn. That's great. I love learning. I can't wait to come every Sunday morning and learn and teach and and to hear from God every week. But we have to go. We also have to do the work of being a Christian. So I want to encourage you guys to go. I know that a lot of you do. Encouraging myself as well. Find more opportunities to go. Make disciples. So let's... Step back and recap a little bit. We're in step three of what's next for Highlands Church. We've already said we're walking in the fullness of God. We're walking in unity. We're remembering the gifts He gave us by remembering the past, remembering the present, remembering our future. The past is what He's done for us. The present is what we are currently doing for Him. The future is where we will all be together in eternity. We honor Jesus by doing what he called us to do. Are we going to be a people who point others to Jesus and to each other? That's what we need to be. We need to be a people that point people to Jesus and point people to each other. Because I tell you guys before, I've said it the last couple weeks, it's all about relationship. This whole life is about relationship. Number one, the most important is our relationship with God being reconciled back to the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. The next is our relationships with each other. We're called to love one another, to be in relationship with one another, to treat each other the way we want to be treated, to treat each other the way God treated us, that even though we might have been enemies or we might have been against Him or we might have been uh, rebellious, that Christ still loved us. So there might be people in your life They're abrasive. They're hard to get along with. Our job is just to love them, to show Jesus to them, and let God do the rest. Let's all stand this morning. Are you ready to see what God has in store for Highlands? To see what's next? Can you imagine what this place can be like teaming with people as we're preaching the gospel and making disciples and growing and going out in various ministries all around locally and around the world through missions, investing in people, investing in the lost, investing in the dark places to shine the light of Christ so that others can be saved. That's what we're called to do as the church together. But the first most important part is you have to be ready. You have to be in relationship with Christ. Keonda, would you mind coming up and just playing something quietly in the background, please? It's too, too quiet. <clears throat> this is the most important thing, guys. We have to be in relationship with Jesus. Amen. So let's all close our, head and bow, close our eyes and bow our heads. That's going to be easier to do. Close your eyes and bow your heads. All right, let's get serious for a moment. Because this is an important step. You have to be in a relationship with Christ. And to do that, you have to believe He is Lord. You have to confess that He is God. You have to believe that God raised Him from the dead, that He is God and He was raised from the dead, that He died on the cross for our sins and that He was raised again victoriously. It's not enough just to know it. You have to believe it. It has to be real. You have to confess it with your words and with your life, with your actions, bearing fruit. And so that's the first call this morning. If you don't know Jesus, man, make that first step of faith. Confess Him. Believe in your heart who He is. Because that's the first most important thing you're going to do. That's the work with eternal implications. Where are you going to spend eternity? 
with Christ or separated from him. So if you don't know him this morning, as I start praying, I just want you to come forward. Don't worry about anyone else in this room. Be bold. Know that it's the most important step you can take. And once you make that first step, God will be with you, walking you all the way. Because he runs to us. He's rescuing us. Remember, he loved us even when we were his enemy and he's rescuing us. And so he's going to run to you. The Holy Spirit is going to prick your heart as you make that confession of faith. So when I start praying, if that's you this morning and you need Jesus in your life, don't hesitate. Just walk straight down to this altar and begin to pray and we will pray with you. We will believe with you. We will let you confess Jesus as your Lord. But maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you've been a Christian for some time, but you want to have that boldness again to go. Maybe you want to feel the mission. that You've heard something today that's excited you about the command and the call of Christ to go into the world and make disciples. Maybe you want a fresh anointing in your life. And when I start to pray, that's the second call. If that's you, come forward as well. Come forward so we can pray with you, encourage you, help you to sense and feel the power of the Holy Spirit in your life as you're excited about what we're doing. So if you need Jesus or you need to be Reanointed, refilled, re excited, refocused. When I start praying, come forward and let us pray with you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. You are awesome. You are amazing, God. Your glory fills this place. God, thank you for being a great God. Thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. God, thank you for reaching us when we were unreachable. Thank you for your son. His life on this earth, his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, his victorious resurrection three days later, that we can have life and have it more abundantly. God, I pray that we will be found in you like never before. God, I pray that you will excite us through the power of your Holy Spirit to go and do the mission you've called us to do to make disciples of all nations and to do it right here from this community you've called us to at Highlands Church of God in Lakeland, Florida. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all glory and honor for what you're doing in our hearts and minds, even this morning. God, as I see more and more coming forward, thank you, God. Thank you for the vision, the passion, the mission to go Some of the elders can come forward and start praying. God, we give you all the glory and honor for what you're doing in this place. Thank you. We worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's pray and believe with those who are here at the front.
Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is in this place. We feel His presence and His peace, His anointing over us like a sweet fragrance. Heavenly Father, we lift Troy as a Hallelujah. God is good, is He not, church? God is good. He is good. Hey, let's celebrate what God's doing right now. <laughs> Lives are being transformed. It's exciting. Let me close with a benediction for you guys. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace this morning, remembering your past, remembering your present, and remembering our shared future. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.